This podcast is all about improving your reptile husbandry. However, I know not everybody has the time or the money to go out and spend thousands of dollars doing custom builds. Thankfully, friend of the podcast, Josh Halter, aka The Bio Dude, is working hard to make better care more accessible. He makes turnkey bioactive kits for leopard geckos, ball pythons, tortoises, invertebrates, dart frogs, and the list continues to grow. He has spent years testing and perfecting these handcrafted substrates and dietary supplements to create the most effective products. If you visit thebiodude.com, you will see he is a proud supporter of both US ARC and Responsible Reptile Keeping, and there is an option to donate to either at checkout. I think Zoomed Laboratories is probably one of the most recognizable brands in herpeticulture. They've been around since 1977, and in 1993, were the first brand to actually produce UVB lamps specifically for reptiles. Later on in this episode, we're going to learn more about a Zoomed product that is specifically designed for bearded dragons. So if you own a bearded dragon or you want to in the future, you will not want to miss this. Welcome back to the Animals at Home podcast. My name is Dylan Perrin, and thank you so much for tuning in today. Today, we are doing a round table all about paludariums or paludaria, however you want to pronounce it. I know for myself, building a paludarium is absolutely on my bucket list. Maybe it's on yours as well. So I thought we should do an episode that focuses on all the how to's and the what not to do's and everything else that goes into building a paludarium successfully. So my two guests today need absolutely no introduction, especially when it comes to this space specifically. That's Dion Solani of Reptiliatus and Tanner Serpa of Serpa Design. Of course, both have very well-known YouTube channels. Tanner is constantly doing builds every single week. Most of them, I shouldn't say most of them, but a lot of them are in that paludarium space. Dion has several paludariums himself. He's done quite a few builds, but he also has a, one that I'm sure if you follow his channel, you know that has his Shinosaurus, which is his Chinese crocodile lizard, which is a much larger species than you commonly see in a paludarium. So that's why I want to have him on as well. In the episode, we discuss enclosures, what to, what in elements you need to have in an enclosure to make a paludarium successful, filtration, water features, which hardscape materials, wood, stone, mosses, plants, which species of animals you can have in a paludarium, and so much more. We really do cover paludariums from start to finish. I know you will enjoy this episode, so let's just jump right into it. All right. Well, Diane Tanner, welcome back to the podcast. I think it's been a while for both of you to be on, so I'm I'm super excited to have you back. Yeah, I think yeah. for me, I I want to say it was uh, 21. Does that sound about right? That sounds about right. And I, probably for Dion too, probably right around that same yeah. time. I believe it was also the same year. Yeah. It's a magical year. <laughs> it's, a, it's a magical year. And I, I have to, uh, I'm going to call Tanner out on something and hopefully Dion can kind of back me up on this, is that now, you know, I've, I've talked to lots of people who have met you in person at Animal Con and such. And they say me? you are, yes, they say you are the most high energy, goofy person there at all times, which has got to be the most stark, like the starkest difference between your online personality yeah. and who you are. Uh, yeah, I would say that's probably true. <laughs> I, uh, when I'm making the content, it's made for a specific purpose. I feel like in recent con, like recent videos, I've done a better job kind of lacing in my personality and adding humor and that sort of thing. But um, I think the only way that you're able to work 95 to 100 hours a week doing this kind of stuff is if you're high energy. So kind of, if you meet me in person, I got to let it out in some way. And usually I'm just <laughs> acting like a goofball. So I, I like to have fun. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. And, and Diane, you backed that up, right? 100%. Yeah. He's a lot of fun. <laughs> well, it, it's some, I mean, both of you create an incredible amount of videos and but Tanner specifically, I, every Saturday, every couple Saturdays when I see your videos, I just think, how the hell is this even possible that someone can produce? I mean, producing videos is one thing, but producing the type of videos that you produce, it does seem insane, especially with the whole move and redoing the whole animal room, animal room in the basement and everything. It seems like gargantuan as far as tasks go. Yeah, it's a lot. I, I'm working to get a better work-life balance because as you'd imagine, I spend a lot of time working. Funny enough, a lot of people would think that a lot of that time is spent in maintenance, which isn't the case as we discuss about paludariums and stuff. I, As you both know, I set things up in a way to where maintenance is pretty minimal. So it's actually making videos and that sort of thing that takes a long time. But yeah, it's, it's a lot of work. If I didn't like doing it, you wouldn't see content that frequently. Mm -hmm. And how about you, Diane? How's your work-life balance? You're producing quite a bit as well. It's funny, like Tanner saying that just absolutely just smoked the nail on the head. Like that's the exact thing I'm struggling with right now. I think I've kind of gotten to this point where I'm trying to shift things a bit and figure out how to get better at that. Because when you are doing something you love as work, which I'm eternally grateful for, 
it's so easy to just like not create or set any sort of healthy boundaries and then the next thing you know you're just oh it's like nine o'clock and i had breakfast but i didn't eat lunch and i should probably eat and then by the time you're done cooking it's 10 you're like what is happening that's that's not right <laughs> and, and then you'll do that for four days in a row you'll be conscious of it and you're like i'm not actually changing anything because it's this like i'm wired like this is how i do things and so like rewiring that process and, and having the discipline just be like, it's OK to just stop and eat lunch at noon and then keep going is actually a tricky thing. And and then, yeah, just making the time to be detached of like different platforms, you know, I'm like I'm really trying to go ham and, and, and uh, post a lot on Instagram because it's grown a lot for me and created a lot of opportunity. And that's kind of the dangerous platform because with YouTube, you can be systematic and create like one video a week or whatever. But with Instagram, it's a lot more about the consistency and daily consistency. So if you're constantly checking your analytics, I don't think that's a good thing either. So just being mindful of those things and and creating that discipline is kind of what I'm trying to do right now. And not always easy. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, and plus Instagram really, and same with TikTok, sucks you in as a user. So you, you go to the platform as a creator and suddenly you're behaving like a user for 15, 20, 30 minutes. And you're like, I'm on here to do some work. I'm not here to like look at people's TikToks. But yeah, yeah. it's a challenge. And I, I can totally relate to all of that, what you guys are saying. I mean, it's very easy to get engrossed with this type of work where I think editing and building as well, very similar. I mean, it's a similar, editing a lot of times feels like you're building something and creating something because you are. you are, And it's so easy to just become so, like you tune everything out. And you're just, like you said, you're just driven on that one task and creating that mm-hmm. balance is extremely difficult yeah i mean well articulated yeah that that's the sort of it and i mean you do find out like if you really take the time to work on that you do realize that there is not to say it's a formula but you don't have to be as present as you think you need to be like it's important to engage with your audience and and you know even with like instagram like like comments and then and obviously you want to do that because it's like an appreciation that people enjoy your content but you don't have to be always checking. Like you could just comment or answer a few and, and make your posts and get off. Don't yeah. start, don't go to the for you page, you know, like that, yep. that sort of thing. And then you're good. And and the algorithm won't hate you for it. But yeah, it's easy to just get sucked into it and then and then it takes away from how much time you have to make the YouTube content. Yeah. And that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think setting aside designated time to do comments and that sort of thing is that. I'm that's kind of what's been working for me. So it's okay every day at X time or every few days, then I go through and do it because then it kind of alleviates that scrolling behavior. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's what I've learned, like doing and I'm bad for this is like doing multiple tasks at once or trying to task switch between things. And you just realize like, A, your day goes by instantly. And you're like, what did I actually accomplish today? Because you're trying to do all these million things. And and you're so much more efficient where you're like, I'm going to sit down and answer comments for 45 minutes. And you can bang out like tons of comments in that time instead of trying to like answer them throughout the day. So anyway, Mm -hmm. it's a a fascinating world that uh, as a creator, you have to work in. And it's, it's, but like you both said, it's We can be grateful that we're working on something that we really enjoy, but there's obviously some challenges to it. But anyway, I would love to dive into the topic today. And the topic is creating paludariums. And, and, you know, this is something that you see a lot of people asking how to do and people are doing it well and maybe not so well in some cases. So I think there's so much topic here. But first, maybe uh, I would love to just quickly know your kind of past or current experience with paludariums. I know obviously, Tanner, you're doing one every week, it seems like. <laughs> so you have <laughs> Lately, some volume. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you have some volume experience there. And, and Dion, you have some experience working with some larger species within a, a, a paludarium. So that's why I really want to talk to you about that as well. But why don't we start with Tanner, just real brief kind of past and current experience. Sure. Um, I've been making paludariums for over a decade at this point with various types of animals, amphibians, invertebrates. A lot of time, I feel like most of the time I include fish in them, shrimp, all that kind of thing. And I would say that, I mean, both of you could probably speak to this better than I could, but I think that I'm probably partly responsible for making them as popular as they were. Because whenever I started doing them on YouTube, really nobody was showing them to that degree. And now they're kind of ubiquitous in the hobby now. So, uh, yeah, I, I feel like I'm probably somewhat responsible for their popularity. Yeah, yeah, I would totally agree with that. And what about you, Dion? Yeah. 
I mean, for me, um, not 10 years. I mean, to, uh, frankly speaking, I'm honored to be in, on this podcast with Tanner for the, but uh, I mean, yeah, I've, I don't know, I've been making them off and on for quite a number of years. Like I've, I think the first paludarium I worked on was actually a store display for a pet store I worked at. Um, well, I actually still work there in some capacity, but uh, yeah, so we, we created like a Vietnamese mossy frog paludarium and there were, um, like I participated in helping. I don't want to take credit for the build, but yeah, that was probably my first paludarium. Uh, and I think that was in 2015 or something like that. And um, I've made a few different, I guess I'll say like different types of paludarium since. Um, and yeah, a lot of learning curves and I'm sure we'll go, get all into that, but they're, they're just very interesting um, types of avariums you can build there. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a really cool crossover for people, whether it's fish or just just adding water features in general into reptiles mm-hmm. or amphibian enclosures is really cool. And and it is also also the place where people really mess up on. It typically, if you add a water feature as just a you know standard reptile keeper, you're gonna have water on the floor. Like that's just the the, the general like rule of thing. Like I'm gonna make this cool waterfall, and now the water is on the floor and not in the thing. So we'll talk about how to avoid some of those. But 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 first, I think. I guess conceivably there could be people listening to this that actually don't know what a paludarium is or how would you define it? So maybe Tanner, did you want to kind of just give us a broad definition of how you define paludarium? Yeah, sure. So when you think of a paludarium, it obviously is under the entire umbrella of, well, everything technically is a vivarium. So a terrarium is a vivarium, an aquarium is a vivarium, so on and so forth. But within the reptile keeping hobby, we typically consider a vivarium a land sort of setup for the sake of viewing animals, right? So whenever we're speaking in these terms, I would consider a paludarium a setup that represents a transitional zone in nature. So a zone that goes from land to water typically referred to as a riparian zone, so marshes, bogs, that types of thing, right? So you have a prominent water feature as well as land. And so I would say that a paludarium is a setup that encapsulates this sort of environment for the sake of housing animals that live within those environments. So it could be fully aquatic animals. It doesn't have to have land animals, so fish, shrimp, that type of thing, or frogs, snakes, anything that would live in that sort of marshy wetland type of area. Mm. And anything to add to that, Dan? I mean, yeah, I think Tanner kind of compass most things. Just to me, in my mind, it's like, yeah, a vivarium that, I guess, incorporates elements that are both aquatic and terrestrial. Mm -hmm. It's kind of how I see it, at least. So, Yeah. yeah. And so one of the things that happens when you do this is even if you have a relatively large enclosure, when you actually start working away at the water section, the water section be- usually becomes a lot smaller than you think. And this is in my, in my mind, you mm-hmm. know, like if you're dealing with an exoterra enclosure or something, uh, or any of those that have a, a, a bottom section where you can house water, quite often it, it's not as big as by the time you add everything in it. And, you know, there's, there's less room for inhabitants in, in those scenarios. So I think the most obvious place to start is enclosures themselves you know whether it's store-bought or or custom built enclosures yourself what are some things that people need to incorporate when they're looking for an enclosure to buy or if they're looking to build one that they should have to make sure that there's adequate space for both the land and the water um tanner did you want to start with that one yeah sure so and as we discuss everything in this video pretty much every decision that we're going to make within this type of project is based on what we're going to keep right so are we going to have animals that are going to be able to climb out? Well, then obviously you need something with a lid. Are you just going to house fish? Then you can have an open top um, rimless aquarium or one of the, sh- it, they call them paludarium style setups, but the glass in the front is shorter than the one in the back. Mm. Creates a cool display, but you could have plants and stuff coming out the front. Obviously, if you're keeping any sort of land animal, probably that's not a good option. Um, but a lot of times I custom build tanks because stuff on the market really isn't viable for these types of things. But um, I would say pretty much any type of tank with the right know-how you could turn into a paludarium. Mm. And and Diane, you use Exoterra. I know the one over your shoulder is Exoterra. Is that Exoterra? Actually, no, that's a Zoomed. Oh, that's yeah, Zoomed. Yeah, that's okay. a Zoomed. Sorry, yeah. Zoomed. And uh, <laughs> so they... 
and that one is a store bought, obviously, and you actually are housing mm-hmm. relatively large species in there, the the Chinese crocodile lizards. So yes, can you walk us through that one? Is that something that you found to be working quite well? Uh, it's working quite well. The animals get along. Recently, I have sort of toyed with the idea of separating them. So I have a one point two, or so I should say, a male and two females that live in that. It's a thirty six by eighteen by thirty six paludarium, and I mean they're not particularly active like they like to bask a lot and hide and then they come out when there's food and and periodically will be a bit more on the move especially if they want to use the washroom like they'll purposely come out into the wider water area and and do that um but yeah so they're not always moving around active like i think they actually have a bit of like a reputation of being very like sleepy and lethargic but needless to say i think i'd like to consider separating them whether it's just the male or not and um but that my experience with that that build i'm just thinking about making another one soon and how i'll do things differently it, it's been great um I, I'm, I'm smiling because i remember going back tanner <laughs> jumped on a call with me graciously to encourage me and, and give me some tips on drilling the tank for a mm. uh, oh. external filter and i never did it because i was too scared <laughs> of chicken and i'm sure we'll touch on that later but um i think that would have been a big game changer because it's just hilarious how i have it set up right now um it works but like yeah we'll get into that i guess uh, but yeah i mean it's it's like what it's probably my favorite one of my favorite enclosures of vivariums i have in in my home i just love looking at it and everything's going very well with it but i do think i want to maybe look into splitting the animals up and having multiple paludariums for them mm. Yeah, and, and drill. I think I did the same thing to Tanner too. I'm like, can you drill an Exoterra or like the, the, these uh, glass enclosures? And he said yes. And actually, you can. I was yeah. su- successfully yeah, able to do it. Um, so that was that was all good. But the one thing with with yours down is there actually a land piece, or is it just branches and trees over top water? So it's actually just branches and trees. So there is, I guess, at this point, there's there's a few cork slabs and tubes in the back half. And they're slanted. And so at this point, there's actually enough organic debris that is like like foliage that is kind of just broken down that there might be something along the lines of soil and moss. And there's a kangaroo fern that's kind of climbed over and off shot or however you say it to keep climbing and creeping over it. Um, so it does like have a bit of area that like obviously besides the branches, there's space that the animals can dry off completely, but there isn't actually soil. Like the only substrate that's in the tank is silica sand. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Or I guess sphagnum moss, but I mean, yeah, yeah it's yeah. not, it's basically inert. Well, I think that leads us well into the water feature. Obviously that's kind of the standout feature for paludariums and, and, there are different ways you could do it. One, you could do it like the way you have Dion with the water, just basically the entire base. Or two, the way we see Tanner do it a lot, which is the, you know, there's an element of transition from a water feature into a land feature before, you know, moving up into the greater enclosure or greater uh, paludarium. So maybe we'll start with Tanner. Do you want to talk about ways that you can dam off sections for what, like within the water sealed area that, that, you can create like a pond or, or a water feature on that allows you to transition to land? Yeah, yeah, there are plenty of ways you could do it. Again, it depends on the animal. So if you're going to have something like my African bullfrog where he wants to dig into the substrate and stuff frequently, in that instance, you're going to, or if you're keeping plants that aren't necessarily going to like having their roots wet all the time, so they have to be in a separate, separated off area, then you want to do a partition of some sort, whether that be a piece of glass or a series of glass pieces to create an area that's separate from the water. You could also use vases, pots, anything you can find around the house, right? That you could silicone in place that will actually hold up to separate the water from it. Um, in other instances where you just need a divide to create a pocket of sorts you could use egg crate or anything that's permeable right so a lot of times they use the knitting mesh it's just like a piece of plastic with holes in it um you could also use similar in like what dion has where you have pieces of bark or whatever but you could actually use hardscape elements themselves to create the barriers so if you get a large piece of driftwood that's stable put that in the tank and then 
either staple or zip tie something along those lines of fabric to go underneath so you create a pocket that way and i actually find that using the hardscape elements like driftwood rocks things of that nature it's a lot easier than creating these intricate structures and it makes it look it's easier to make it look more natural because you're you're not gonna have these hard edges of glass or egg crater things of that nature um but yeah, I feel like that more or less answers the question. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I feel like when, when you are working with this type of enclosure, y- you know, you could have a section of the enclosure that really you want to keep dry and not have any water seep underneath it. But is it in general, mm-hmm. is it just easier to have, kind of like you're saying, like if you're creating a land section that the water can actually be underneath that section, maybe not visually, but do like, you know what I mean? Like we're not trying yeah. to create a physical barrier. Is that the easier version to go? I would say yes, and it's more practical as well because you're not losing out on water volume. So if you have a 10-gallon tank, how, however big the footprint is underneath of it, if, if you have, whether it be a piece of glass or something, right, to create an overhang so that everything underneath of it is water, you're retaining that entire footprint as opposed to taking away half of it by having this partitioned off area. And you could, again, still have all of the substrate, all that kind of thing. So in most cases, I, I would say it's typically how I do it. Mm. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And that was kind of what I was alluding to earlier is w- once you've partitioned everything off into a tiny square, suddenly you're, you're, you have like a gallon of water <laughs> yeah. or half a gallon and, and whatever you put in there really doesn't have a lot of volume to work with. Um, Dion, do you want to walk through maybe the, the filtration? and the, Because that, that'll be the next big thing is like how, how the circulation happens within, these, uh, within the, the paludarium. And maybe we'll start with an example of maybe not the most ideal and work our way to something sure. that's a little more uh, fine-tuned. Yeah. Yeah. So like what, what do we want me to walk through just like as far as equipment goes, what I'm doing or like the process of like filtration and why it's important and stuff to you. Let, let's walk through the equipment first and then yeah, we'll, okay. we'll get into the, the, the importance, but I'm curious how you worked your way around not drilling yeah. and um, we can encourage people to get those, <laughs> sure. get those drills out. Yeah. So originally, um, so oh, I'm trying to remember which I have a Zoomed turtle canister filter. It's whichever models rated for, I think 75 gallons and this paludarium as far as like the bottom lip goes, I think the volume is about 20 gallons of water just to like make the contrast there. So I wanted something rated much higher because there'd be three larger lizards in there. Um, So initially the first issue was how am I going to get this filter to filter this water with like 36 inches of height and not drilling it. And it's trying not to laugh, right? It's <laughs> fine. <laughs> no, I'm teasing. And uh, yeah, so initially it was about like trying to prime the thing. Uh, and I was using these like long, because even what what, like, what comes in the box is obviously not made to do something so silly. So I bought like at Home Depot, these PVC pipes, and I literally like drilled holes in the screen and it would shoot all the way down into the water. And it's a testament to how powerful the the motor is and the impeller or whatever in the in the filters. It actually was able to prime itself and get all the way up and over. But the issue that I would run into is if the power would go out, mm. I couldn't get it to start again. Because what I would do is like fill the intake valve all the way to the top. So there was already that much water in it. And then I would manually fill <laughs> the outtake and then reconnect it. So it was already like the system was full of water. And as soon as it started forcing and more water was coming in, it was giving it that extra oomph to like suck all the way up and then it was running and we were good. But if the power ever goes out, bad that news, like, ring, ring, ring. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> so eventually at some point I was like, this is just chaos. Like something's going to happen and I'm going to burn out this motor or worse. I was talking to Armin from Herb Time. And he, what he did is he took like a pump because he also didn't drill one of his tanks, not to throw him under the bus. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and he, yeah, he took like a small pump. I can't remember which one I went with now, but, and he, uh, he just like basically took a, uh, yeah, like a tube and had it run into the, like he extended the intake tube all the way into the tank and hooked it up to a pump. So it's feeding the water. So even if the power goes on, kicks back on, boom, it's being fed um and that's what i have going right now so i have it set up on my outtake is on the left side of the tank so 
um, you know, fresh water is coming in on one side and then the opposite side, just to kind of help keep things moving has the intake and it's sucking up the water and sending it across the back behind the plants to the canister filter. And so that you're is using my... a small pump to pump into the canister. Yes. And then I just like make sure that the area it's in doesn't have a lot of organic debris to like block that pump. And it's gone so far. I've had it running for over a year like that. A few power outages here and there, just whatever, weather, etc. We're going strong. Okay. I think if I decide to redo the whole tank at some point, I'll probably have to hit up Tanner again and <laughs> Yeah. Or just watch his videos too. Well, uh those filters, they're like I've used them in the past for similar setups. They prime terribly. So yeah. even just swapping out the canister in your current setup, you could probably avoid how you mm. have it. So Okay, good to know. Yeah, yeah, there's nothing more annoying than a pump that won't prime. Because it's just like, oh, you're hearing that annoying grind and you're like, come on, just take. And then as oh, soon as you get that, rawr, rawr, like it's filling and then you get to go. But that, oh man, that was so annoying when I had fish. Yeah. Or than just the fact that they're so expensive. So you don't want to, you know, a nice big pump like that if you don't want it to just croak on you either. Right. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, I mean, at some point I have to figure something out. I, I just need to take the plunge. Like I have a few other buddies now that are drilling all their frog tanks and stuff and they have like the diamond bits or drills and something like, come on, Diane, like get it together. But there is always that fear. You're going to crack like a $500 Canadian tank and just cry a little bit. So, but you got to learn. So I'll, I'll I, give it a shot. I will say that if the glass is a quarter inch thick, I don't know what that is in millimeters, but a quarter inch thick or yeah. more, it's ex and it's not tempered, obviously, it's yeah, extremely it's not. easy not to crack it. But when you start getting thinner, that's when it's a little sketchy, mm -hmm, in, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Yeah, I, I trust I am, your opinion. <laughs> I'm not a glass driller. But I've done it a lot. Like I'm not a professional at it, but you know, watching Tanner stuff and learning that way and aquarium people, I, I have never actually had an accident doing like drilling that way. I've had I've had issues cutting glass. I mean, I, I like I was watching one of Tanner's videos just recently where you're using like the back end of the glass cutter to cut a small piece when you don't have enough leverage on one side to snap off like maybe like a mm. half an inch of glass. I've never had success doing that where you like tap down the the cut mark to like make the seam. <laughs> that never works for me ever. I'm always like this is gonna be great and then it's just like jagged. <laughs> but drilling I have it's 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 worked every time. So I have faith in you down. I think you could do it. Thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate you guys. You got As he this. sends us a picture of a shattered enclosure. <laughs> yeah, look, this is your fault. <laughs> yeah. So, Tanner, with you, when when you're working with the water featuring and creating a pump system, quite often you do use like a small, just little little pond type pump. Uh, maybe you yeah. could tell us about sort of what you use as far as that goes. And then, are you feeding it into filtration, or quite often are you just feeding it back into itself? Or t talk to us about water flow. Sure, sure. Yeah. So in, in an instance where you're not comfortable drilling a tank, which I would say is probably one of the better options because you don't have anything else taking up space, just have a clean bulkheads, all that type of thing. But in an instance where you have to use a small pond pump or something of that nature, there's a lot of ways around it. I'll make glass partition boxes that just kind of go in the corner and the water can be pulled underneath through the pump up and wherever you need it to go. You could also use PVC pipes. I'm sure you've seen that as well, where I get a big, usually it's three and a half inches, I want to say, maybe four inches, but you cut the PVC pipe, silicone it down to the bottom and drill holes along the bottom. So basically creating a reservoir, a spot where you can isolate the pump and still pull it out for maintenance, because that's probably the one of the biggest mistakes you'll see is people put this pump in and it's working great but it's working great when it's working great as soon as that thing gets something in it and you can't get to it then either you got to cut the cord and put a new pump in or um you no longer have a pump yeah yeah, yeah they've sealed it <laughs> uh, in with cement <laughs> right but in those instances where i'm using a pump in that way Typically, I will set up the enclosure in a way to where I don't need the biological capacity of a canister filter or something of that nature to filter the water. I'll let the plants do the work. I'll include hardscape materials like lava rock or a porous stone where all that good bacteria can get in there and really filter the tank. Because at the end of the day, all that a canister filter or a sump or any sort of external filter is, is a spot that can collect debris and harbor good bacteria so you have all your ceramic rings and different things in that that they can grow in 
So if you can use plants to get the biological export of the different things, and then you have somewhere for bacteria to grow, then you don't need a filter per se. Okay. Mm -hmm. is, is there a line in your mind that you roughly draw between just being able to passively filter to actually running it through a canister or a sump? Is that just inhabitants uh, based or? Yeah, it's just, yeah, really just inhabitants. If you have something that's eating very heavy, then probably you're better off to have something that's going to pull out all those particles and stuff like that. Sure, you can include cleanup crews like snails and things of that nature that could help. Um, but something like a turtle, for example, it's it's pretty much mandatory that you would have something like that. Although I feel it's a lot easier to keep a clean turtle tank than they often get a rep. But yeah, I would say it's mostly inhabitant based. Okay. And then as far as filtration goes, you know, you've kind of mentioned some of the, obviously the important, anyone who's had fish understands the importance of filtration and, and with reptiles too, you know, sometimes they're producing quite a lot of waste. If I'm sure the Chinese crocodile lizards down are, they probably produce a decent amount. So filtration is a must. Are, are you, are you doing any like physical removing of feces or anything? I like before I can get to any of it, like they're swimming around and it's breaking up and okay. like the, the mountain minnows get in there and they're just like, most of the time it's, it's almost like dissipated. You, you I'll periodically see urates and things like that, but, um, a lot of it just kind of, yeah, like breaks down and it's, like it's not like necessarily even visible or you wouldn't recognize at a certain point that that's like fecal material. Um, but like eventually there'll be some debris on like on the sand and then I go in with my water changes and I'm removing all of that, whether it's like leaf litter or other things that get into the water. So, yeah. Um, well, yeah. you know, you think about as a fish keeper, you, you sort of have a rough idea of how much waste is going to be produced by the fish, but you obviously have to include the reptiles in that rough calculation as well if they're pushing water or pushing waste into the water so tanner you had mentioned that 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 zoom ed pump was not great for priming is there is there certain canister filters that you definitely recommend as far as if someone needs like powerful filtration yeah um I, lately at least i've really been liking the flu like fluva 107 to those ones they have this little plunger on them mm -hmm. so when you need the initial prime you just and no matter how you have it set up it will so like in diane's case where he has this tube going up three feet or that sort of thing you just hold a little plunger and it, it will be primed pretty much immediately you just got to wait mm -hmm. for it to fill up with water so i've been liking those um it's like yeah that's pretty much like right now based on all the other ones i've worked with i would say it's probably your best option and they're they're fairly inexpensive for what they are and mm -hmm. i would say in most of the cases from what i've seen the pumps it's it's less about the pump strength but more so the capacity of the canister it's, itself so the 107 is smaller than the 307 it has less mm -hmm. baskets so if you need more biological capacity then go with a larger one but for paludariums and stuff you really don't need yeah that strong of filtration the best part about providing high quality reptile husbandry is you get to develop a long-term relationship with your animal meet jackson my 18 year old crested gecko jackson lives on the biodudes terrafauna substrate which is one of their substrates that's specifically designed for warm biomes and humidity spikes like all other biodude substrates it contains organic content to help support the plant life in jackson's vivarium it also holds moisture very well which means humidity is never an issue even in my dry climate another favorite of mine is the biodudes bug grub this is a supplement powder made from natural ingredients like carrots, beets, spirulina, oats, and potatoes. Everybody knows how important gut-loading feeder insects is, and this simplifies it for me and allows me to be confident when I feed both Jackson and my tarantulas that they're getting the nutrients they need to thrive. Also, if you have a lot of babies right now, this is a great way to help fortify the diets of neonatal reptiles. The BioDude has a ton of great educational content on both his YouTube channel and the website all about bioactive care, and it's just one of those brands that's doing their part to push her pediculture into a positive direction and give reptile keeping a better name mm -hmm. and okay. yeah yeah i mean it, i guess is it nice to have something that's going to capture sediment and and things like along those lines i mean if you're just running it through a small filter that just or not a filter if you're running it through a pump that just feeds back into your water feature or whatever it is is it nice to have some sponge somewhere along those lines to collect debris or is that something that you don't really worry about um it, in in certain instances yes it's nice to have the sponge but ideally you want a system to where that stuff's going to be processed out naturally, right? So you have the snails and different things in there. And so by the time it's 
this very small um just particles and stuff right then the plants will process it mm -hmm. so essentially you want to create an ecosystem right okay so maybe should we throw no we won't throw plants into this part of the uh, conversation just yet but for people listening know that obviously roots in plants is a crucial part of filtration if, especially if you're filtering through a passive capacity as far as not using an actual filter and you're just letting it kind of flow so so we'll, we'll come back to that I, I would love to talk about water features themselves Diane. i don't know how much experience you have like creating like waterfalls or trickle walls or anything yeah. like that uh, it, it, i know tanner has a million different experiences <laughs> that he can probably share but maybe we'll start with Diane. just it, i'm not sure if you've sure. done any builds like that yeah, so I mean, going way back, I've made a few, and it's funny, like the first one I made was, it was a build I made in like 2014 or something like that for a trio of uh, Dendrobates tinctorius, like dart frogs. And I made like a zigzag waterfall spray foam that came down into this pool and I had drilled holes in it so that it would stay just like full to the brim and then like just empty out into the, the like the false bottom and then feed back in to the tank but just as tanner mentioned earlier <laughs> i was going to talk about this as like one of the big faux pas is like yeah i didn't really have a good way to access that pump so it was like you know if you have to do maintenance or anything on it it's it's absolutely crucial to create like a passageway that you can access and also ensure the animals can't get into and fall into um to be able to remove that pump if you need to because yeah i was basically as you said cement <laughs> and yeah. that was my first experience and then um with the uh that other paludarium with the vietnamese mossy frogs again with that it was just kind of helping with it but yeah that also had like a waterfall system that kind of ran down and then we did some things with um clay to kind of create more of like a stream to like help create a barrier that would hold along with using different pieces of driftwood to kind of guide the the passage of the water um but yeah like those are incredible setups like uh, but beyond that no i haven't really done too many of those sort of palladarium setups well, and I think there's such a draw to do something like that because having a water feature that has trickling and moving water is a really mm -hmm. nice aspect. But there, there's also, and we'll get Tanner to expand on this, obviously when you're dealing with pumps, you're dealing with water capacity and flow and th that can be a challenge. But I think it's also a challenge not to make your water feature just look like a water slide, you know, where it's just like a curved out section of the, of the wall that basically is so obvious that it's just meant to hold water in place and it doesn't actually look that good. There's moving mm -hmm. water, but it looks very magical made so tanner what are some some things that you do to to avoid the water slide effect and to maintain and to make sure that you're not blowing out the sides with with water flow and whatnot sure yeah well to kind of touch back on what you said about uh the water capacity of the pump and everything like that an easy way to get around that is to create an overflow area so you you'll have a spot at the very top that can fill up with water and then that overflows and then that can turn into whatever you want, whether it be more overflowing sections or a uh, trickle, anything, right? Um, because then say the pump only does 50 gallons per hour or whatever, it doesn't really matter as much because it has a spot to collect. And then from there it comes down. You'll find that if you were to go straight from the tubing, then to the water feature it doesn't really create that flowing effect mm -hmm. unless you're using a really strong pump which in a lot of cases you don't really want um so i, I feel like that's a good way around that so i would say that the easiest possible way is just to use hardscape alone right so if you set up rocks and things like that to where there's a little trough or something of that nature in between them and then you just foam the joints add glue and moss and things like that to hide the joints then you have a path that you don't really have to do much to create you could also make tiered areas that's a really good way to make it look like multiple waterfalls mm -hmm. and things like that you could literally use petri dishes or little deli cups things like that cut a groove in them so the water can overflow out of it and stack them up and it's easy to put hardscape around the sides of them to make it look natural while also retaining the water to this specific area. Because I feel like that's another aspect of creating water features that it's probably 
either the number one or number two air is you create it, it looks cool, but then the water is just leaking out the sides. And before you know it, the, the entire setup is saturated. Um, and then I don't, it, it, it's hard to discuss in a podcast because a lot of times it's just very situational and wacky where I have PVC pipes that are creating soaker features or glass boxes that overflow into this thing. And then I, so I know it's kind of a non-answer, but... Um, well, people yeah. can check out... I know you just started your YouTube channel. You're brand new to it. So there's some <laughs> very basic videos on there yeah. for now. But, <laughs> but once you get going, I think it'll be fine. When, people can go check out what you've done. And there's... I mean, there's so much. But I think that is really important as far as like the... Not not allowing it to just seep out by the time you get to the base of the water feature that basically no water is flowing out of it because it's all just dissipated itself throughout the rest of the, the feature as it works its way down. So... Uh, maybe we, you could just list off some, some materials that you use to keep it confined into its path. Yeah. Like, are you using spray foam, silicone? What are some tips? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, silicone works in certain instances, but it's not really it's not really ideal for hardscape. It will stick to things a little bit. So if you just need it to kind of glue stuff together initially, it can work. But if you're trying to coat things in silicone to waterproof it, just th don't even bother. It's <laughs> way a waste of material and messy and all that kind of stuff um i really like to use the two-part epoxy a lot of reef aquarists use it but to actually secure the pieces together uh cures faster than silicone and all that sort of thing but to actually waterproof it expanding foam it's a must it's pretty inexpensive if you're able to get one of the pro guns i want to say they're 15 bucks at home depot or whatever and it uh, has this little thing so you have a shut off on the foam you'll pretty much never run out of foam and you won't waste anything and it's very easy to apply and then obviously super glue cyanoacrylate use that to do the joints but yeah in most cases i would say it's expanding foam and then the materials themselves so glass acrylic whatever yeah and, and that pro tip for the spray foam is that just allow you to reduce the amount of volume of foam that comes out the end yeah, well, so it gives you complete control. So you can, the great stuff, expanding foam that, you know, pretty much everybody uses, or even the pond foam, you can get it. It comes in a larger can and it's more expensive. I, I want to say the cans are about $12 each, but it has maybe three to four of the other cans in it. And with the pro tip, it's a, it's like a metal gun, right? Mm -hmm. It kind of looks like a silicone caulking gun, but you have a little dial on it. So you can fine tune how much foam you want to come out of it which is nice because if you're trying to use that little plastic one that typically comes with it you spray it and before you know it and there's a, you know there's just this huge oh, yeah. mound of foam but if you have the pro tip you can just like hardly press it and it will literally just the smallest bead will come out which most of the time is all you need right so it gives you complete control you'll have very little waste in the material and it actually gets all of the foam out of the tube itself because with mm -hmm. those other ones you'll do it and then no matter what there's always about a third in the can that just doesn't want to come out yes yes <laughs> i think that's a great tip i mean how many times have i sprayed with something and been like okay this looks great and then go upstairs come back down an hour later and it's just dr seuss in my enclosure like there's just like orbs <laughs> growing out of it. like okay this is way too much i've done and you also like need to learn to let it dry for just maybe half an hour so it's still pliable and then you can like really get rid of a lot of the air inside that foam and it you know it, it kind of seals a lot tighter so but i think that yeah. that, that more expensive gun is definitely worth it maybe we'll spend some time talking about the just hardscape materials we're kind of already on that that topic just the types of wood and rock that, that you would recommend using diane what, what do you have in the current um, chinese crocodile enclosure as far as wood is it just random stuff yeah. or yeah go ahead so so in that build it's actually right now the wood that I have in there is a combination of things. So the, the background is the um, the compressed cork tile um, and it's like a one inch tile thick. Uh, so, I mean, that's like one component that makes up the background. And surprisingly, it's not really breaking down in the water. And that that build's been there for four years almost now. Uh, and then as far as wood goes, it's a combination of cork and also different like deciduous branches. I'm pretty sure most of it's maple. Um, Just and from outside. some of it, yeah, exactly. From outside, it's like, I, I mean, like I kind, I didn't actually like 
bake bake it or anything but i just treated it like cleaned it and uh i like put it against the wall in the summer for like a week and just cooking in the backyard at like 30 whatever degrees celsius weather so i don't know like 90 something for you guys <laughs> and uh i think and um and yeah so i mean that's that's like the majority of the wood um i in like some of the other builds i do for hardscape like i i like to use um things like lava stone or lava rock because it adds a lot of surface area for like beneficial nitrifying bacteria or even the clay balls well I mean, it's not really hardscape but like um you can add some of that in your drainage but i mean yeah and then i think i have some it's not dragon stone i have some type of aquarium stone that's also in the shinisaurus build but yeah that's that's pretty much it for that one mm. uh, yeah and Tanner, what about you? What are some of your favorite hardscape materials for this uh, this type of work? Um, I have a lot of stuff that I really like to use. To touch on the wood real quick, I think one of the things that's best is obviously Diane touched on the deciduous aspect and the maple and everything. But a quick test is do like a scratch test. So if you scrape the surface and it starts rubbing off, probably don't want to use it. Uh, hardwoods are best in that regard. But Things that I personally like to use are, um, for texture, I really like to use spider wood, so skinny branches so you can get them coming through with roots and that type of thing. I really like Mupani because it, it, it comes in a lot of different forms. You can get pieces that look like roots, pieces that look like branches, and it holds up forever. I have pieces that literally I've had since I was 14, and I'm st still being able to use them in tanks. Malaysian bogwood's a pretty good option for that as well. It's extremely long lasting and pretty much with any of these woods, if you have a pressure washer, you just clean it off real quick between builds, you're good to go. Um, and as far as stones go, dragon stone, it's easy to use. I like to use it sometimes. Lately, I've been really liking to use sandstone because it it has that porosity and it also has a wicking effect. So if you have it partially submerged, a certain portion of it, maybe two to three inches up the stone will be wet. So you could grow moss on the areas outside. Um, Save you stone's cool, but it gets kind of heavy and it's also a limestone. So it hardens the water a little bit. Um, I, I don't know. Pretty much I'll use anything. But those, yeah, those your basement looks like uh, mind. your basement looks like a store, you know, you like all those drawers you have, all those different things. I think anybody who had, does this kind of work is like so jealous of your workstation. Hey, it's a labor of love. I like it. It's it's something I did so it could be interactive for. I don't. It doesn't happen often, but when I have people that come here, so I could actually teach people hands on how to do stuff, and I'm trying to become more organized in my life. So that was one way I did it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I like it. And then as far as, you know, something about putting wood in your water basin, whatever your water basin is, obviously you're going to create the tannin effect depending on the type of wood you have. So some people love kind of a tea colored water depending on the species and some people don't like it. So it, it, tanner, is there types of wood, let's say you want to create a high tannin uh, water feature, maybe list off some wood species. And then if you don't sure. want any, uh, let us know. Yeah, well, if I wasn't on YouTube, all of my tanks, you wouldn't even be able to see in them because I love the tannins because it, it just it brightens the animals colors so much. It de-stresses fish a little bit because their line of sight isn't as far, but I could go. We could have a whole podcast about why I love tannins. Uh, <laughs> Mupani wood is extremely tannin heavy. It, it will leach tannins for years. Um, so if you want that black water effect, definitely Mupani is a good option. Malaysian bogwood will for, depending on the size of the piece, maybe six to 10 months or so, but it, it doesn't take too long to get them out of there. Um, oak, oak's pretty prevalent in that. The only issue with oak though, is it kind of gets this fuzzy film on the outside for maybe about a month or so after you put it in, whereas the other ones I mentioned won't. And otherwise, if you really want that tannin effect, get some Rui Boss tea. It, it, you could buy it anywhere, right? But make sure it's only just pure Rui Boss. Boil that on your stove, let it cool down. Got tannins instantly. <laughs> mm. 
Yeah, I, I like the tannin effect as well. I think it looks really cool. Adds a, a really nice element to the water. And what if somebody wants crystal clear water but wants wood feature within the water? Is there certain species that don't leach tannins? Yeah, um, manzanita is pretty tannin for you. It, it might get a little bit yellow initially, but it, it, in no time it will clear up. Um, spiderwood doesn't really create that much tannins. And I don't know. Those are those are ones that immediately come to mind. But I'll, there there certainly are species that won't. Or if if you can find one that's been soaking in water for a while already, then you can avoid it. You could also boil stuff to speed up the process. But yeah, those are, those are a few that come to mind. Yeah, yeah. I remember years ago trying to boil a piece of Malaysian driftwood to get the tannins out, and I I, I think I gave up after a week. I'm like, what the <laughs> hell? I don't. I just don't think you can boil these tannins out. Every time I dump the water, it's like darker than the last time. So, yeah. But, that's how it goes. Uh, now, one element of some decor within the water is leaf litter. And I think each, each of you already mentioned it. I think, uh, Dion, you're sort of, I think maybe leaf litter is getting added to the water basin just by virtue of having so many live plants. Uh, anytime yeah. I've tried to put water or leaves inside like a water feature, they just foul the water. So I'm curious, Dion, do you have, do you struggle with that? Do you, do you have to pull the leaves out or what, what do you do? To, or you just, um. you just don't worry. I mean, I don't like the pothos leaves falling in. Those get gross. Like, they're not adding anything. They just turn to mush and, like, get, slime. like, I don't know, bacteria and slime on them. So those I pull out immediately. I don't think they add any benefit. The fern leaves seem to, like, they kind of... It's also, like, they're more fibrous or whatever. So they'll, like, actually stay for a while and hang out with the, the whole, like, aesthetic. But, I mean, I'm usually like systematically manually adding leaves. The go-to is like obviously the Indian almond leaves, but those do produce like a good amount of tannins. But obviously that's like, as Tanner said, you can go into that in a whole separate podcast, but that can be beneficial for the animals as well. Um, but I mean, lately I haven't been doing that so much because I find that I think just where the age of the wood is at already in the build, it's starting to actually produce more tannins than it was originally. So I'm finding that if, I want to kind of keep it at a like medium darkness. I'm having to do more regular water changes. So I'm not really systematically adding tannins to the water, but mm. um, yeah, it would be like my go-to is just the Indian almond leaves or even um, coral berry. You can, I know Exoterra has like the equatorial forest floor. Like they like some of these different companies will sell like small compact leaf litter and I've been able to drop some of that in and eventually it does take in the water and sinks and it's nice like because some of the almond leaves are enormous. I know you can buy like tiny ones, but I, I like to actually have like intact leaves and not tear pieces and put them in. So mm -hmm. sometimes it's nice to have smaller foliage. Um, but yeah, those are usually what I do. And Tanner, what about you for t leaf litter tips, especially like how to keep them from, you know, messing with the, the quality of the water? Sure. Uh Leaf litter and any botanicals really, so seed pods, all that sort of thing. I kind of follow the same rule of thumb as I would driftwood. If it's been cured, then it's assuming that it's a safe leaf to begin with. But if it's been cured, so it's been dried out, all that type of thing, typically it's fine to put in a tank where you kind of run into issues when you're using these live green leaves. Or So if you just went outside to an oak tree and ripped a bunch of green leaves off, they're going to foul the water. But if you waited until they've been dried out and they're sitting on the ground and you put those directly in they would most likely be fine so that usually is an issue i've also or a, a way around it but i've also found that thicker leaves i can't think of any species off the top of my head but i've had a buddy send me stuff from florida and it seems like a lot of the thicker leaves they don't take to the water as nicely so when they start to break down they'll get kind of white and sort of like the pothos thing where they they don't break down well. So for me, I typically stick to hardwood leaves like oak, maple, that sort of thing. And I um, have a ton of oaks around my property and I know they're not getting sprayed with pesticides or whatever. So it's typically what I get these days. You can buy oak leaves, but um, there's websites that sell a lot of more exotic stuff from Peru and that, that type of thing that are cured properly. So pretty much if it's been dried out, you can probably get away with using it. Okay. Well, I think maybe now is time to jump into plants. I know people are probably chomping at the bit to get us to, to animals and things that we keep in them. And we're obviously going to talk about that, but, but let's uh, set, finish setting up these virtual enclosures for people with the plants. Uh, 
obviously breaking down into, I guess maybe there's like semi-aquatic, aquatic and terrestrial plants and maybe some mosses in there. So maybe Tanner, do you, do you want to just jump on that? Do you want to talk about some of the plants that you use? Maybe, sh- maybe we'll focus on aquatic and semi-aquatic primarily just because people can find information about terrestrial plants anywhere. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So there's, I, uh, not, not to have a shameless self-promotion here, but I did a video a few months ago now about using house plants and stuff in setups like this. I, I think it's the best guide that I've seen, at least on this sort of thing. So after you watch this, um, if you would even want to link it up in the show notes, I think sure. it would be a great resource for people on this stuff. But yeah, pretty much any plants that are typically sold as aquarium plants, right? Most times they're grown terrestrially out of water in a greenhouse. The vast majority of those will take to this type of setup very well. And the cool thing about it is they have different growth forms out of the water than they do in the water. So if you plant them in the water and they start growing out of the water, you kind of have the look of two different plants and it it creates these really cool aesthetics. So that's a good option. You know, Anubias, Cryptocoryne, um, Bulbitis, Bucephalandra, all that, all that. There's so many different aquatic plants that work really well. Um, and then as far as more terrestrial items go, Diane mentioned about the, um, ca- you said kangaroo fern, it was. Yeah. Any of those sort of rhizomal type ferns that grow on a horizontal stem like that. So those uh, um, rabbit's foot fern, different ones like that, that they, for whatever reason, they go extremely well in these setups. And like you explained, they create those structures and land masses that the animals can use and they i mean they just look awesome too so Mm -hmm. that's a go-to any sort of vining type plants so apothos obviously which i i try to avoid using as much as possible but it's just a good option you have its giant cousin i guess the monstera that can work which is technically a vining plant uh there's Man, I honestly, really anything that they sell at big box stores that are tropical plants, 95% of them will work. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good to know. In in, in or out of water. Obviously, that goes down the whole rabbit hole of cleaning them and quarantine and all that sort of thing. But just if for, for your own insight, like if you go there and you see it and it's not something that gets eight feet tall, probably it will work. (laughs) Diane, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I mean, no, those are all very great options. Like I, I agree, like pothos, not to reiterate, like, I think that I understand, like I always get made fun of <laughs> a few friends are like, dude, you have pothos and everything, but it works. Like as far as someone just wanting to get into it from not having a foundation whatsoever, like pothos is so hardy. I mean, I've grown pothos in a closet in the dark, like left it for like a few months and it was still growing. Uh, and it's so good at absorbing, you know, nutrients out of the water too, because it can be grown just in water. It doesn't even need substrate. So plants like that are a great choice. Adding to the ferns, I wanted to also mention lemon button ferns. I've just had so much success with those. And I find that they look a bit more fragile, like some of the maiden hairs and other species, but they're actually very hardy. Um, so I think they're a great option, even like they can tolerate some dryness, but also if the substrate's a lot more wet or moist, at least, um, they thrive in those varied conditions. And then also like a lot of the species do get pretty big, but the, uh, bird's nest ferns are also pretty cool. Like some of the smaller compact variations are like the, what do they call it? Like the crispy leaf ferns. I find Mm -hmm. those ones usually stay more compact. They can handle the varied parameters too. And they're pretty hardy. And then obviously like just also, um, different mosses are a nice way to transition from aquatic to terrestrial too. And you can oftentimes like repurpose mosses that are supposed to be just like aquatic. You don't have to get like a terrarium moss, although I would say a lot of those will grow a lot nicer if you can really find the true, not just like temperate species. Um, I find that even like Java or Christmas moss. I think Christmas moss, I kind of like the way that grows better. Like I find it, it's more of like a dense carpet than just in my experience, than like the Java moss tends to just do wild things and like grow up kind of more in the air too. And you'll get more of like a carpet if you want to use a aquarium species with the uh, 
the Christmas moss, but or like a fire moss or something like that too. Um, but yeah, but then those are just a few things that come to mind. Yeah, no, that's great. And and Tanner, did you want to add anything about moss? I mean, I think a, there's a lot of information about moss on your channel, and you collect yeah. moss outside. And and what are some of your favorites? Um, for outside at least, the best stuff. I kid you not, it's literally what you'll find growing in the sidewalk. It just it <laughs> does so well in these types of setups, and really for any of the mosses, the smaller, the finer the fronds are on it. It seems like the better it does in these setups, and you'll see a lot of the actual tropical ones that you could find on the market. That's how they look. They're these really fine fronds, and they they just grow really well in these setups. You could get away with sphagnum moss, obviously, but it's a little bit harder to find. Fern moss. Those are a few from around me that work pretty well long term. But yeah, like Diane said, all the aquatic type mosses and stuff. Java moss obviously is a pretty because it's dirt cheap, so you could just get like a gallon sized bag of it and immediately have a, a, a fully mossed out setup. <laughs> Flame moss. There's some rare ones like bubble moss, and um, I even use uh, Susvasser tong now. It's like a it looks like a lettuce or a macroalgae almost. And if you can get that going to where it has water on it constantly, it will grow out of the, um, like on the land. So, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of options with moss and to touch on the pothos thing again, there are so many varieties of that as well. I think most people typically use, um, I guess golden pothos, yeah, but there's, yeah. Baltic blue, Cebu blue. There's so many different varieties. So, yeah, you don't have to stick with just the the golden pothos. That will, if you don't have a good pair of pruning scissors, then you will just have pothos everywhere. It's amazing yeah. how well it grows. But yeah, the other ones are nice, like the Cebu blue and the. And what was the other one you mentioned? Oh, the Baltic. Yeah, Baltic blue. It looks similar to Cebu, but it's darker blue, and the leaves get slightly bigger. Mm -hmm. And I think moss is is a real nice way to kind of tie the vi visually the enclosure together right hide maybe some of the foam or hide joints uh is there anything to add to that tanner as far as like you know using moss in an aesthetic way as any reptile keeper knows proper nutrition is a cornerstone of animal welfare in captivity that's why i want to take a quick minute to tell you all about zoomed's dragon food dragon food is a specialized diet for bearded dragons it comes in two formulations one for juvenile animals and one for adult animals and it is the result of three years of research and development it is the first pet food to use green banana flour, which is a pesticide-free wheat alternative, which is low in sugar, and it's also a natural source of resistant starch, which feeds the microbiome in your dragon's gut. The product has a satisfying crunch, which simulates natural prey. As I already mentioned, it's wheat-free, it's also soy-free, and it uses real black soldier fly larvae for a high calcium protein source. If you own a bearded dragon and you're looking for a way to add some variety to their diet, please check out Zoomed's Dragon Food. For more information on this or any other Zoomed product, make sure you head to zoomed.com or check out the link in the show notes or the YouTube description. Yeah, sure. So there's a lot of ways you can do it. If obviously in a water feature or whatever, if you can just wedge it in place, that's the best way to go about it. You could also super glue it in tie it to branches on my channel a lot of times i'll use this wicking fabric it's you could buy i guess higer lawn would be the proprietary version of it but you could literally go to a craft store and just say i need some cargo mesh fabric and and it's the same thing it's just not doubled up so you tie that onto branches and as long as any part of it gets wet the entire thing will get saturated so you could tie moss onto that and eventually you'll just have a crazy feature um but yeah typically i like to use it as a a softener and what i mean by that is if hardscape if you have a very hardscape focused setup it looks odd if that's all it is the way i've explained it to other people is it looks liminal because typically in nature you don't see th there are instances where you see it obviously but typically you're trying to make these tropical type environments and stuff you rarely see a setup where it, or a spot in nature where it's just sticks and rocks and stuff there's always plants in between the things so if if you can soften the edges with moss different other types of plants then it, it will just make it look that much more natural and another good plant i should have mentioned was cryptanthus it's actually a type of bromeliad but they're they'll grow in so many variety of ways whether directly in water or on land and stuff so 
Okay, awesome. Well, I think that gives people a lot to... Uh, or Diane, did you have something to add to that? I, I was going to also mention, because you're saying aquatic and terrestrial, <laughs> I, I kind of forgot to mention like um, floating plants. Like mm, even uh, just yes. like the... I had that written down here too. Yeah, the... I'm terrible with Latin Duck names for plants. Like the lib... No, or, or yeah, like, like frog bit and stuff too, or yeah, like I mean, any of those are just another creative and an elegant way to leach nutrients out, or you know, um, repurpose some of the nutrients being produced in the water by the animals or the inhabitants, and organic debris. So, um, sometimes, like some, sometimes you have to really be careful that they don't overtake everything. Like, I've experience it myself You're like oh i'm just gonna put a little bit of like duckweed in there and that's like do not don't even ever bring duckweed into your tank i mean i i like the look of it but if you're not going to be on top of just picking some of it out and uh it, it will take over and just like choke out everything <laughs> but it, it can add to the appearance and overall aesthetic too so so I, that's what i actually duckweed was one of the questions i had because it does look cool and it, i can it can be very tempting to add but mm -hmm. like i i know that it proliferates quite quickly so i'm curious if, if either of you have a, a similar plant that works well that doesn't kill everything or or do you use duckweed in the way that diane said just you know make sure we're pulling it out once in a while i actively use duckweed in a lot of setups i just uh take i mean with the vampire crab setup they eat it so mm -hmm. There's that, but I would say Salvinia minima is probably the best option. It, the leaves are a little bit bigger, so the texture is not as crazy, but it's a lot more manageable, and it, it will overtake if you don't pull it out, but most of the time you just pull it out, and nine times out of ten, your local fish store will actually give you some store credit for it because they sell it. Mm. So you take it there, get yourself some crickets or whatever the heck you need for your animals, <laughs> and... Be good to go in that regard. Red root floaters are another good option, although they're a little more finicky. Um, but the thing with floating plants is odd is they'll be doing super good. They'll be cranking, doing their thing. And then I, sometimes it's just, I don't know when it happens or why it happens, but we'll just decide like, all right, I'm done here. And then they all just die. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Our time like, is I can done. Speak, yeah. I can speak to that too. Like, I mean, I um, I was going to add that, yeah, the limnobium species, I think that's the genus and forgive me if I'm pronouncing it or saying it wrong, but like the frog bits, like they're, they're nice. Cause like they're definitely in the right conditions. They grow really fast too, but definitely less fast than the, um, like the duckweed. Uh, but they're kind of cool. Cause they'll bring down like they're pretty delicate, but they send down all these long roots too that just look cool. And I think they add some cover for some of the inhabitants like fish to at least have like view breakers or, you know, between seeing different uh, competitors in the environment and whatnot. But then, yeah, like some of them are a bit more delicate if there's any flow, like some of those species don't do as well if the water is moving too much. But like Tanner said, I find that with those, they just take full of advantage of whatever resources are available to them in the water and grow like crazy and then they just like melt away and you'll have like five left or, like what happened so you have to probably do a bit of dosing with nutrients and such to keep them happy but they're also cool because they don't take over as much yeah and visually i think it's a really cool effect to add to a, to a paludarium so uh, why don't we jump into the moment that i'm sure many people are waiting for as far as the animals and inhabitants you can have in these types of avariums or, or paludariums i think maybe let's start with the aquatic side and s s some of the again this kind of doubles back to what i had originally said is that quite often the water feature in a paludarium is quite small so it is difficult in, unless you're dealing with you know the shinosaurus like dion is most of the time you're not dealing with animals that are taking up quite a lot of space so what are some animals that you can put into into the water feature whether it fish inverts or or amphibians maybe uh tanner did you want to start with that one then we'll go to dion yeah sure if we're speaking with the water feature smaller nano species of fish so a lot of the rasbora you got a phoenix phoenix rasbora exclamation point they could safely live in five gallons roughly so if you have a good yeah, you know, enough volume, then you can get away with it. I would say something also to consider is when you're thinking of an aquatic space, five gallons is not always five gallons. And what I mean by that is if you have five gallons and it's a lot of vertical space, the fish can't use that as much. But if you have an area where the water is maybe two inches thick, but it's a large swimming area back and forth, you could actually keep some larger fish in there because 
that that's the space they need typically the back and forth they don't need all this um vertical space so could consider that but i would say yeah a lot of the rasbora some tetra endlers so endlers live bears they they can typically go pretty small um some species of danios although uh, others get pretty big and th they're an active fish so they need decent amount of swimming room back and forth obviously you have all your shrimp so your cherry shrimp i mean they're bulletproof everybody loves them they're a good option sometimes you could get away with a mono shrimp but they're they get a little bit larger so you probably want five gallons or more any type of snails people who watch my channel they know i love my snails pest snails whatever kind of snail throw them in there they're good to have around so <laughs> malaysian trumpet snails bladder snails i really like ram's horn snails just beneficial to have around you have scuds so little um sea shrimp that type of thing how do you how do you get scuds like uh, scuds are almost like a springtail equivalent in the water <laughs> in a way right they're like a little small kind of invert cleanup crew type thing it, yeah where do you get them so i got my original culture from a fish store they were all in the planted tank and i'm like i see you have scuds in here are you selling them and they're like ah, not really I'm, I'm like well i'll buy some can you get me some and so they went through and got i don't know maybe 20 of them and now i have probably thousands of them so i would say that's a good option ebay pe people sell them like that it, it's it's one of those things where you kind of need to know a, a fellow hobbyist that has them and they'll, they'll just be like oh yeah here you could have them type yeah, of yeah. deal but hmm. how, how important do you see them in the ecosystem <laughs> I don't use them in a lot of my tanks. It's only okay. specific ones, but I think moving forward, I kind of want them in most of my stuff. They're, yeah, think of them like a springtail. They, they shred everything up. They help clean things. I will say, though, that if they're not completely fed, they'd like to nibble on your leaves and stuff. So if you want pristine foliage, they might not be the best option. Okay, yeah, that's mm -hmm. good to know. Uh, Dion, do you have anything to add to water inhabitants? Um, Are we talking about just like general critters you'd want to keep yeah anything any, anything that comes yeah. to mind whether it doesn't have to be fish or invert you could whatever yeah. i mean yeah also just to add like to because you didn't mention them by name tanner but like i like knee right snails i think you didn't mention them but yeah like those are also super cool i mean they yeah. have a problem though yeah the the eggs that is true it's funny you mentioned that because i have eggs all over my <laughs> So I quit. I quit them. using them because of that. That's funny. Because they <laughs> yeah. lay eggs and they don't reproduce really. In yeah. Don't they need right? brackish? <laughs> yeah. I think. Yeah. That's hilarious. Well, there you go. Case closed. Yeah. <laughs> I have eggs all over my glass right now in the wood. So, but like I have found that they're pretty efficient at cleaning things. So I mean, now maybe I'll have to go back and pick the species you talked about. <laughs> I mean, there's so many cool varieties though, and they're long lived. So I get it. I mean, I've had at least 15 different species that i could think of and they're mm -hmm. cool but whenever you're trying to have a pristine scape or whatever and you have these hard little yeah. things that are extreme difficult to scrape off I, I just at some point i'm like i can't deal with this anymore <laughs> but, but tanner what about the um you, you mentioned like pest snails that you will even accept those i mean i've had those and when i had cichlids get really carried away how, how do you maintain their population are you using like assassin snails or something in there to no I do have assassin snails in some of my setups, but I find that it's very, especially in the setups with botanicals, so you have your leaf litter and all that kind of stuff, their populations are dictated by food. So if you have a lot of food for them to pull from, they'll be prolific. If food's not as prolific, then they die back. So really how your environment setups dictates how many snails you have. Mm -hmm. So okay. like you'll see a lot of beginner aquarists, right? They're doing their thing. And then all of a sudden I've got a million snails and yeah. you're probably overfeeding your fish. And so then the snails have something to eat and then they become prolific. So I would say that they're, think of them as an indicator species. If you got a mm -hmm. lot of them, they got food. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's a great way to put it. Um, Diane, do you have anything else to add into the water? I, I mean, like... I don't know if I'm getting ahead of myself. I mean, I, I would like to hear more of Tanner's experience because I haven't set mine up that way yet, but I would think like vampire crabs are super cool. And, but it's more of like the transition, like they're, they're in both environments. In fact, more terrestrial, but they, I think, 
I don't know. It's interesting. Like when you're thinking about the palladium too, like all the fish that you want to choose, you really have to remember how you're going to use that space. If you have enough room to add a heater and all these different elements too, because like in some cases, like you're, you're just taking more and more space away. I mean, there's all sorts of creative ways that you can add heaters to like a, um, like a back component that you've created sort of like what Tanner was describing before, where you, maybe it's a reservoir or in the same space as the pump, if you can do it. And, um, but you have to, you know, take all that into consideration when you're choosing what species you're going to add. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't know. I, I like to use, I, I find myself using more uh, fish, at least in my builds that like don't require heaters. Um, but that's just been my experience. Cause like with the Shinisaurus, I'm not doing that. And um, even with the croc skinks or, or my glass frog tank I have with, it's a paladarium too. It's mostly just, um, yeah species that can handle not having a heater and seems to be working well yeah that that's a really good point that uh, i probably should have brought up earlier was heating the water T- tanner do you typically use species kind of like dion where you're not having to heat the water and if you do how do you I, do it? I heat very few of my aquariums i heat i heat the vampire crabs tank and i heat my salt water tank and that's it and i use a lot of species that prefer warmer waters like bettas and things of that nature But one of the aspects to heating a tank that I think often gets overlooked is that all of the other mechanical components you're using heat up the water itself. So the impeller in your pump, that heats up the water a little bit. Then you also have your lights, that heats up the water a little bit. Is the tank completely sealed up? That heats the water up a little bit, right? So the heater is just kind of filling the gap if you will but i keep my just the way my room's set up in the basement and stuff it's pretty consistently between about 74 to 78 fahrenheit so i find that that's equivalent or like it works well for pretty much everything that i want to keep and i don't i don't have any issues mm-hmm. okay yeah that, that's good to know uh do you want to touch on the vampire crab success or how, like how does that how is that uh enclosure working is it successful sure. or is there is there issues with it um, my only issue with it is that the condensation, well, it's not really condensation, but the, um, mineral buildup of the water on the front is a little more than I would like, but it's just kind of the way that the water is splashing off of stuff. It, it's just creating more of a, a blockage than I expected. So I got to find some way to get around that. But I also, you don't see them very much. They're very reclusive. I I knew they were, but I think I expected them to be out more than I than I do. And so I'll go maybe three or four days. I don't see them, and then seven days in a row, I'll see most of them out out and about doing their thing. So it, it's really interesting to kind of learn their behaviors. Um, I find that they at least mine when I see them when I see them out, they're typically near the water which would make sense because otherwise they want to be buried in the dirt and that type of thing. And the way that my thing is set up, all the land areas are kind of hidden behind the waterfall. So if they're back there, I there's really mm-hmm. no way to see them. Um, but yeah, th- they're cool. I-, I like them. They're pretty interesting, easy to care for from what I've, I've been able to tell so far. And if, if you want something that you don't mind, you don't see it that often with interesting behaviors and stuff, you definitely like them. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that is a neat species for sure. Well, why don't we just quickly discuss some of the above water species? And, you know, you don't necessarily have to think about things that you've done personally, but are there like reptiles or amphibians that come to the top of your head that you think would work very well for a paludarium? Like I said, you don't have to have the experience with that species, but since you each have experience with paludariums, maybe you know kind of what works and what doesn't. And and uh, maybe I, I'd be curious to know if even some snakes come to mind as well, because there's probably people that might want to do books potentially both. So Diane, did you want to start with that one? Sure. To put you um, on the spot. Yeah, no, you're fine. <laughs> I, I mean, like, uh, some of the species that come to mind right away, a lot of amphibians, obviously. Um, like uh, as a kid, I guess it's funny as I'm, as I'm talking, I'm like, you know what? I've actually done more paladins than I realized. <laughs> I only got like 10. I, I mean, I used to keep fire bellied toads and, I think they're a great option and I won't speak too much to it because I know Tanner can talk a lot more about them and how awesome they are. So those come to mind, a few species of newt that like fire-bellied newts and 
Um, there's all kinds like those Turkish newts people have now. I can't remember the name of them uh, off the top of my head, but uh, there's a few species that are pretty popular, even Spanish rib newts, but they're mostly staying in the water. Um, and then even, you know, like I keep crocodile skinks. Um, they, they can be kept in a paludarium. I would probably suggest having a setup that isn't super deep for them like they can swim and they'll dive in when they're afraid but i just i like thinking about it or at least being very clear that the build allows for them to easily get out of the water with branches or roots or whatever it is uh, but they they do i've seen some pretty massive builds and it's super cool like they love to go into the water and swim as yeah so I, I think they're an awesome option um for snakes I think garter snakes get overlooked a lot. I know that um, depending maybe in the states where you're from, there might be some species that you can't keep, but uh, I think they're they're underrated. Like they, they're very active, they're interesting, and they, they can do well in a paludarium setup. Same with uh, rhinoceros rat snakes. They will spend a lot of time around and in water too. So anything that's like, not enormous and going to produce a lot of waste and then obviously you have to then account for that with like your filtration and what you're doing i think those are probably more of the beginner or just generally easier to work with species because yeah like with a lot of these larger animals they're producing large volumes of waste like even as like a hypothetical if you had a ball python and you could somehow keep it that way like the amount of waste that animal produces eating a whole rat going into the water like that's a lot of waste to have to manage right so i think of like smaller colubrids and things like that or um yeah i don't know i want to leave something for tanner to share yeah so. no those are great what about you tanner are there things that you've used that have come that have been great or things that come to mind as good I, options i mean yeah well there's a lot of larger animals i think of one that immediately comes to mind is anacondas i mean mm, that's true what, what what there's a lot of snakes that obviously would work but that's like a aquatic snake like it just immediately comes to mind right mm -hmm. um most frog pretty much any frogs really because they they like to soak in water and that type of thing um obviously you mentioned about the fire belly toads i mean they're not as prevalent these days because the only ones typically that you're going to see now are captive bred whereas 15 years ago or whatever they were just wild catching them all and they were dirt cheap and stuff like that so they're they're not as prevalent these days but they're just such an awesome animal they have silly communal behaviors they bark to each other they create these little hierarchies and stuff and they're just perfect for that type of setup um i would i don't know pretty much if if the animal lives in an area where it's around water naturally then it's suitable for a paludarium i i think i'll just keep it pretty general <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> Totally. I mean, I have a rainbow boa, so that's the same sort of thing, like very similar to anaconda where they, and there's nothing, so it's, I guess it would be the closest thing I have to a paludarium. You guys can see on this camera or over this shoulder, that's like a, like a little pond that I have in there. And I, don't, I maybe it's like eight gallons or something. And it is really cool seeing her in there and watching how she can hide. And, and a lot of times I'm like, I don't think she can breathe, but you see, you find her nose, like the tip of her nose just out of the water, those sort of things. But when she poops in that thing, <laughs> it's just such a mess. It's like oh, it's, yeah. it's like I gotta like reserve a day of like cleaning it and like and it's not set up at all to handle any waste. So it's like you know something that doesn't happen very often, but it's definitely something where if you were to put a large animal in an enclosure, you need to have um, a waste management system. What about like if you were to combine like I think like a lot of like small anoles and things like that, I think would work well in sort of the uh, the um, terrestrial side. But I mean, maybe neither of you have thought about this. But as far as like cohabbing things like that, like with maybe like the fire belly toads and, and newts, do you ever, or not newts, uh, anoles, do you ever think about like, is there clashing there or is this something that as long as you're dealing with somewhat smaller animals and they each have their own habitat that you don't think it would be an issue. And maybe you don't have enough experience with that specific, you know, area to, to, to answer on, but if any, <laughs> well, either of you want to jump on it. I actually kept anoles with my fire belly toads when I first got them they all the anoles managed to escape i mean this was probably at least 12 years ago right so i was not as good at what what i do as i was so whatever they they made their way out and i never <laughs> found them unfortunately the only issue with fire belly toads is i get technically they're toxic 
I never had an issue with them killing fish or anything like that. So, so there is that concern to some extent. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think an obvious solution is to find animals that actually cohabitate naturally. So do, do they live in similar niches and areas? Um, but uh, yeah uh, otherwise yeah are they small enough not to eat each other or yeah you know of of similar size and they're not gonna battle then pro probably it could work yeah Dion, do you have anything to add to that yeah i mean this is a conversation i have quite frequently with friends of mine too that are fellow friends in the hobby and um i don't know it's a tough one because i think in some ways it can be absolutely fascinating to see how these animals can occupy the same space and hopefully get along or maybe it's something you're doing because you want to have like a natural order of things where maybe you're adding an inhabitant to for example like the assassin snails regulate the population of another species so there, there are elements where people will, will systematically do it for that purpose or like you know you're adding vampire crabs to the build where you have all these powder blue isopods taking over because you know that they're going to just hunt them all down to a manageable manageable number or worse i think where the issue lies for me at least is at the end of the day you're kind of doing it for you and i think there's like a fine line between compromising like i wouldn't want to do anything where i'm like stressing one species out and i think that mm -hmm. can be the tricky thing sometimes like especially if amphibians they could be super opportunistic they're just going to try and eat like anything they can fit in their mouth in a lot of cases like i think there are some species like red-eyed tree frogs i've worked with a bit off and on like i don't think they're as ravenous but like a white street frog you know you, you, they try to eat you half the time you're trying to tong feed them so i don't know i think just like there are ways it can work but it's also you have to be conscientious that it is like for your own pleasure and you want to try, I think, to navigate it in a way. Maybe that's kind of vague, but just to say that like you're not going to compromise the animals like because they're at complete mercy to how you're choosing to keep them. So if you can do it that way, you're not going to like, you know, not add a basking light because one inhabitant won't benefit from it, but the other really needs it. Like if you can do it all right and really research and like kind of how Tanner said, like find species that actually cohabitate naturally too or um i think it can be very rewarding and super interesting but i also think it could backfire too if you're not really thinking it through before doing it because i see a lot of people are like oh i want to do all these cohab builds it looks so cool but there's a lot of thinking that needs to go into making that decision ahead of it i yeah, yeah i i agree with everything you said too i think that's why i typically don't do those types of builds because for me i'm kind of interested in a specific species right and uh it it can get i think it there's an ethical gray area there that is very wise to consider before doing any of that yeah i think that's perfectly well said by both of you and any, I think the cohabbing is easiest on the aquatic side. If you're doing fish, like you yeah. want to keep a, a few different species of fish, that's fine. And then you want maybe like a snake or, or, a, you know, a knolls in the branches that, you know, that's sort of the thing that can work. But when you're, you know, like you said, Diane, you're not, the goal at the end of the day is to achieve the highest welfare for the animals you're keeping. It's not to achieve a really interesting thing to look at. Like that's the secondary goal. And of course, that's a big part of reptile keeping and building these things because there's a huge amount of joy and pleasure that comes on the builder side and the keeper side to establish these things. But to make sure that the animal does come first, I think is crucial. And I think at the end of the day, people will be listening to this and they may want like a concrete answer. This is the animal that you should get. But you need as the keeper need to go and investigate yourself and figure out what animals would work best and and again reminding yourselves that once you do start partitioning an enclosure to an aquatic section and a terrestrial section you have decreased that usable space for whatever animal you're using you know a fish is only using this section and, and vice versa so you do have to you know th the point of this conversation is to stab give you the tools to build it and then you're going to have to go in and and uh, you know find the animals that will work well for that space is there anything that we didn't say today that we wanted to make sure we said before we wrapped up as far as like any other mistakes that you can think of that people make or maybe maintenance tips? I know Tanner had said at the beginning that maintenance is actually a pretty small part of paludarium experience for you. Is there yeah. anything that comes to mind for either of you? Well, for me, I don't, most of paludariums are really easy to take care of except for my African bullfrogs. He leaves some 
sizable logs in there <laughs> and like nothing's taking care of that they gotta be manually removed unfortunately like it literally looks like a dog turd <laughs> 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 yeah you can't just leave that uh drifting in the water <laughs> yeah so l- larger animals like that i would just say be be aware of whenever they're gonna do that and just save everybody the headache and just get rid of it when you see it mm-hmm. yeah that's good Diane, anything from you as far as maintenance or mistakes um, or anything yeah i think with these types of builds and i think i think tanner kind of touched on this too like I mean, for just thinking of like the big obvious mistakes that I've had issues with creating these sort of builds is uh, making sure one, like the whole thing with accessibility to the pump that's creating if you have a water feature. So like we touched on that. Um, One thing I've dealt with a lot that can kind of be hilarious in the worst way is like not being careful about how you have those water features set up like you'd be surprised one little strand of moss will wick all the water out of your stream into the substrate Mm -hmm. and and then you have you know like all this bacteria and aerobic bacteria and it's chaos and you have to replace everything um otherwise i don't know like yeah just having a good understanding of like a nitrogen cycle. And I mean, obviously if you're coming at it from aquarium world, although like technically soil also goes through nitrogen cycle and all that, like you have a understanding of that, but just understanding like, again, what inhabitants you're keeping and how frequently you should be doing your water changes and such. I think that's really important too. And, and you know, the, the importance of, um, just like mechanical filtration and, and how you can really take advantage of like what you're using. Like, you know, I've, I think Tanner was also talking about like the surface area and such and like maximizing space. Like I'll sometimes really try to be selective about what I'm using as a drainage layer. Cause I want it to harbor more beneficial bacteria um, just to like break down, you know, your, your uh, nitrites and then, and then just, plants do such a good job of repurposing those macronutrients like your nitrates just go into the plants like i know again pothos gets a lot of hate but it's really good at that too and uh for the beginners out there and yeah i don't know i think that's kind of what comes to mind do do either of you test the water at all to to indicate when to do a water change or no tanner's shaking his head and diane's nodding his head (laughs) i don't know who wants to go you can go first if you want go ahead tanner I'm to the point in everything that I do, unless it's a newly established tank or whatever, these ones that I have that have been going and I know they're stable and everything, I only do water changes because I just out of habit and I think I need to, right? And I might do it once every two or three months. Oh, wow. But uh, uh, yeah, otherwise, it's, it's just go in there, do a little bit of manual removal of some waste and top stuff off. But just if you have high plant load good filtration a lot of area for biological you know uh my bad beneficial bacteria i'm uh i need to eat lunch i'm getting loopy here (laughs) Uh, yeah yeah um but it just set things up in in a way that they maintain themselves then i i find that i don't really have to do anything and personally it it probably somewhat of a controversial thing to say but i prefer to run my tanks a little dirtier I find that the animals, they like it better. Everything does better. And I I try to be as hands-off with the animals. As, unless they're animals that I handle, like my crested geckos or whatever, I try to be as hands-off as possible so that they can just be free to do their own thing. Yeah. And, and Diane, as far as water testing and water yeah, changes? Yeah, so it's, it's funny how, I like I, just to add to kind of what Tanner's saying too, is like initially with, this paludarium behind me is like the biggest setup I had made and have right now. That's a paludarium. Like initially I was on the ball, like always wanting to test and freaking out and stuff. And I'm at a point now, like, yes, I do test periodically. Uh, but I'm mostly the biggest issue I have is just losing water through evaporation. So I find like I'll do water changes. Not that often, probably every two weeks with that build. Um, and then, yeah, it's like, more than that i'm just topping off water and i like there's a lot of evaporation that happens with that build so i mean i don't actually close the top off in any way so that doesn't help it's just like mesh and there's you know heat lamp and all that so naturally there's gonna be a lot of evaporation um but yeah like i i learned quickly that 
every time I'd go in and do water change or sorry, a water test, um, I'd be like, okay, like everything's looking pretty solid, ammonia, nitrates, nitrate levels, pH is pretty good. Um, and yeah, it's just because of the plants. Like if you have a ton of plants in there, do they're doing so much of that work. And I was surprised to even see, like I wasn't expecting it initially, but at first the kind of transition was that Pothos started really taking over the build quickly and putting out this incredibly large foliage. And then I added the kangaroo fern and it's actually outcompeted the Pothos over time. And the, the kangaroo fern will put down those like feet and it puts out these Im- like these just like massive black, very dynamic roots into the water. And yeah, it's just sucking up all the nitrates. So I don't really do that many water tests anymore. Uh, but I was initially just kind of freaking out about every little thing because it was very new for me. But I, I agree with Tanner. Like I think you're right. Like you can you can find a lot of like confidence or just reassurance and seeing like if you have healthy plants a lot of plant material growing in the tank it's going to kind of take care of itself and it's mostly topping off and such yeah Yeah. and i think a lot of that comes from experience too i mean we've been keeping and doing this for decades right so you just kind of know at a glance if something's wrong Mm -hmm. right if i look back at when i was you know 16 18 years ago when i first started really keeping fish and stuff I i was testing water a lot then i was cleaning tanks religiously every day like every saturday i was cleaning the water and cleaning the filter and all that kind of stuff but yeah it's just the the longer that i do it I, my animals seem to like it better when i do less and yeah cool yeah well gentlemen thank you both for for joining me on the podcast today and i think this is the one that's going to be very valuable to people this is a it's a project that so many people want to tackle but it's also intimidating you know adding a water feature things leaking not sure how to do it so i think this will give them a lot of you know great place of a foundation to start from i know it's not needed but we're going to do it anyway can you each of you let you let us know where they can be you can be found online your youtube channel and and instagram we'll start with dion Sure. Thanks. Um, yeah. So I'm Reptiliatus and you can find me here on YouTube and then also on Instagram and Facebook. Technically I have a TikTok, but I haven't posted on there in like a year. So, um, primarily, yeah, the three other platforms, mostly okay. YouTube and Instagram. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. And Tanner, uh, pretty much in the same boat as Diane, uh, Serpa design on YouTube and Instagram. That's where I'm most active. I'm, kind of trying to get more active on instagram i go back and forth because it's one of those things where i just get so caught up in the youtube stuff that i i gotta just focus on that but i'm fairly active on both of those i upload weekly or i try to at least on youtube and then i have a tiktok but it doesn't really seem like it likes me that much so i only post sometimes and it's hard for me to be active on social medias that i don't really personally use that much like i don't go on tiktok so to post on there it's kind of weird but I'm mm. on Instagram for at least once a day and um, I'm on YouTube regularly. So yeah, that's where you can find me. Awesome. Well, again, thank you guys both very much. This was a fantastic episode and we will absolutely have you back on in the future. Maybe it won't, we won't wait three years this time for either of you. So <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks yeah, so you're much welcome. for having us. All right. That is the end of that episode. Tanner and Dion, thank you so much for dropping by and sharing all of that incredibly valuable information is much appreciated. I know the listeners will probably think the same. Listeners, if you are about to take on a paludarium project, maybe at some point in the next couple of months or a year, I would love to know about what you're doing. Please put in the comments on YouTube or Spotify. If, if there is a project coming down the pipe, I'd love to hear about it. I think that would be fascinating. If you enjoyed the episode, please consider sharing it on social media. That really does go a long way to help build the audience of the show. If you'd like to support the show financially, you can do that over at patreon.com slash animals at home, or you can check out custom reptile habitats. There is an affiliate link in the YouTube description and show notes. If you make a purchase using that link, and a small commission comes back to me at no extra cost to you, which again, helps me keeps the lights on in this room. And I think that is it for this episode, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. I will catch you in the next episode.